not only do I love to listen to him as a performer, but I have loved to listen to him as a broadcaster. Steve Flans, welcome him to the stage, everybody. <laughs> Uh, go ahead and grab that and, and get comfortable, and I just might stand. I'm not sure. There you go. I guess I won't stand. <laughs> um, what's fun about uh, knowing Steve is that I knew the last name of Blondes long before I knew him. With my parents being in the music business, I heard of his father. And uh, with that being said, I know you grew up, uh, grew up in a household full of music, too, didn't you? I did. And um, uh, in fact, I know that my father and your father knew each other, were friends, and made records together. I believe that's true. That's right. And so uh, Harry was a Harry was a, a Dixieland a clarinet player and a saxophone player, and had his own groups uh, during that Dixieland revival of the early '50s. Okay. And um, so there was him, and then my mother was a at home piano playing a woman with a bunch of sheet music in the in the piano bench, and so I heard a lot of tunes. Uh, under her tutelage as well, and learned to sing harmony with her at the piano. Well, what kind of music was that, though? Well, those were tunes from the 20s and 30s, you know, standards uh -huh. and those good old tunes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you first got interested in actually doing something with music at what age? Oh, gosh, I was dilling around, you know, probably when I was six or seven at the family piano. And okay. Then an aunt gave me a ukulele when I was 10. Uh-oh, was that what got you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I have a, I heard a little funny story about um, your dad and you wanting to get into music and by any chance did he want you to play uh, trumpet like he? No, he was, uh, I, he never really uh, said he wanted me to play anything particular. Okay. He, he sort of supported me on, on piano for a while and then guitar. Um, I thought you were going to say something he said to me years, years after that, which was, he said, uh, he said, whatever you do, don't go into this business. This is not a way to make a living. <laughs> Well, and, and I thought he said something... And, and he was basically right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought he also said, if you play guitar, don't play. Oh, yes, don't play any of that crappy rock and roll. He said, <laughs> there right, you yeah, go. Yeah. Did yeah, you? And I actually didn't. I didn't. I was you a, didn't? I was a musical snob. I was a jazz lover, and I stayed away from all that <laughs> pop music for a long time, which cost me a lot of work over the years. <laughs> oh, yes and no. I mean, I, I dabbled in R&B and got into jazz, and yeah. I still kind of dabble in both of them. So, uh, I mean, I know you and I are going to get more in-depth when we go into the studio together, yeah. and we'll hear more of your life. Um, talk about uh, some of the groups you may have played well, in as I a younger tell, person. Well, I, I, th I thought I'd tell you a story about an, an early job I had. So I started playing as a teenager um, with friends and I had a, was in a couple of little bands. My father kept saying, you know, if you join the union, I'll hire you. Because in those days, that mattered yes. to be a member, yes. member of the union. I right? agree, right. And, you know, and so eventually, I think it was 19 when I joined the union, and he had a gig, a regular Sunday gig, and suddenly I was on the band. Very and, nice. And, you know, I didn't... Think about this. What were you making back then? Can oh, you remember per gig? Lordy, I don't know. In the 30s, maybe? 30 bucks? 20 bucks? I don't know. There you go. Um, and I, I never, it never dawned on me until years later that, you know, he couldn't have just, he just added another person to the band. Oh. And he must have paid me out of his pocket. I never thought about that before. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He I'll just wanted, darned. and the guys in the band were really wonderful. I mean, the boss's kid comes on the band, and you think, oh, wow. You know, oh, yeah, this, right. What's here, this going to be like? Here we go. So <laughs> night after night, I'm sitting there literally learning the tunes on the bandstand, listening to everybody play, learning this tune, learning that tune. By the time I've been there for a while, I learned, I learned the tunes. My brothers played. would tell similar stories yeah. about our dad throwing them on And that's really part of this music. You know, there's, there's a point at which most of us were invited on the bandstand yes. by the elders... Right. To join the band and be part of the part of the whole scene, and it's that kind of a that kind of passing on from one generation to another that happens. I know that you've done some broadcasting too with Jazz. I did. Talk about that a little I bit. I did. Well, uh, Michelle Jansen and I both uh, seemingly came up with the same a similar idea at the same time, ah. and so we got together and put together a program which was on the air for about four or five years. It was called Jazz and the Spirit. Remember that one? And uh, yes. We did. Oh, thank you. We had some listeners. I know we had some listeners. <laughs> I <laughs> loved we, it. We, had, we did a series of interviews with musicians, and basically the conversation was all about what's the connection between your music and your spirituality. Yes. And it turned out that there was lots of people had to say about that, given the opportunity. And we were, 
We interviewed a bunch of folks from the Twin Cities, you twice, I think. I believe so. Uh, Carrie Thomas, who's going to be playing later, well, was one of our interviewees. Beautiful. And uh, some national people, and it was, a, it was a great experience. Oh, that's so cool. So I know you've been um, a guitarist on many sessions, on many CDs. I know you're working, and one of my favorites that you're doing is Friday at the Dakota with none other than... Irv Williams. So I've been... Uh, <laughs> thanks. Yep. It's been, uh, it's been my joy to have uh, a chance to play with Irv every Friday at the Dakota. Uh, Irv, Irv, Irv is three months shy of his 98th birthday. And uh, so this is, a, this is a true legend. I'm like, like the son of the legend, sort of, so to speak. And, uh, and Irv, is a, Irv is still playing. You know, he's still... He's still Beautifully, by the way. Yeah, he's still doing yeah. it. And uh, it, it's sort of funny to me because um, over the years, I've, I've actually rarely worked a steady gig in a jazz club, but now I've got one, and my meal ticket is 97 years old, so. Oh, now that's a story. There you go. Speaking of stories, you wanna play a little bit? I will. Steve Bonds, everybody. I'm gonna move over a little bit. I'm gonna keep this for a second. I wanted to play this tune um, because for about 25 years I worked, oh, I did hundreds of gigs, I suppose, with a wonderful musician who's now not with us any longer. Bruce Allard was his name. He's a violin player and a trumpet player. And we did lots of strolling jobs, walking around shopping centers and strolling from table to table at dinners. And Bruce always, always, always started the gig with the same tune. It was just a way of getting into the job. We didn't have to worry about what the first tune was. He always called the same tune. So we're going to play Watch What Happens.
Thank you. Um, like, like many young jazz musicians, uh, certainly in my day, before there was jazz studies programs, we mostly learned our craft by listening to other people play it. Uh, bought a lot of records, listened to lots of performances, tried to play what we heard. It wasn't a, a, a quick and easy process. Uh, those are the days of LPs, and so when I was trying to learn a tune, when we were trying to learn tunes, you had to pick the needle up and put it down, pick the needle up and put it down, pick the needle up. <laughs> And those records are just crap right now. I mean, they just completely. <laughs> so one of, my, one of my important early influences was a guitar player named Barney Kessel. Um, and I loved, his rec I loved his music, and I bought all his records, and I tried to learn his songs. And I'm going to play for you a, a, a Barney Kessel arrangement of a beautiful Duke Ellington tune called Prelude to a Kiss that I learned, oh my god, I learned this 60 years ago, I suppose.
Thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. So one more. Uh, this is just a favorite tune of mine. I love the groove, and it's called Love for Sale.
Thank you, thank you. Steve Blondes, isn't that fun? Yay!